But what I started to realize actually through the guidance of my beautiful mushroom friends was like, hey, how I treat that is how I get treated in return. And I am definitely connected to everything and everyone around me. And that is the world that I create. Now, to receive a big piece like this, when for the majority of my life, I played somebody else's role of what they think success is, that was when I truly felt like I actually started to live my life, my life. Welcome to the multiverse, where we believe that mushrooms can actually save the world. Each week, we'll be meeting with thought leaders and experts to extract the best insights and stories across everything from functional fungi psychedelic medicine, and so much more. Thanks for listening. Step into the multiverse with us. Welcome back to Into the Multiverse. I'm your host, Ali Shaper, and today is a very exciting day because we have one of my favorite people to have conversations with sitting right next to me on this lovely couch. Her name is Blue, and it's very difficult to think about how to intro you, actually, because you're truly a jack of all trades. You have you know, I, I like to talk about the idea of being a multi-potentialite mm-hmm. okay. and you are a really great example of just all of these different things wrapped into one. And it's such a good representation of how important it is to diversify your skill sets and play with your life. Mm. So I want you to introduce yourself in a second and explain to the listeners what you, what you do and what you're up to in the world. But um, before we kick that off, I think it's really important for people to understand. And one of the things that I came to realize by nature of deep stalking you on the internet (laughs) in preparation for this is you've gone through some of the most transformational Mm -hmm. experiences. You know, you were not the same person you were 10 years ago, nor are any of us, but you've really gone through so much of, you know, what you like to call a rebirth. Mm -hmm. And I think just to start there, like talking about, you know, the difference between how you were Mm -hmm. 10 years ago to versus how you are now, Mm -hmm. I think is a really good place to start. Mm. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, Jack of all traits, it's like the the question of like, what do you do for me feels like trying to fit the ocean into a glass and be like this like i'm at parties i was at a gathering the other day and someone was like, like many people first start the conversation like what do you do i'm like uh well uh, uh, you know try really trying to narrow it down here um but ultimately um okay so how have i transformed and then i guess i can go into what i do or do you want me to yeah no go for it okay Whew, well yeah there's a shamanic cycle um, in in the human experience that we all go through, like the seasons, and um, like there's winter and there's summer, and and the shamanic cycle is like death, purification, rebirth, integration. Death, purification, rebirth, integration. So when someone's going through a process or their a, a part of their identity is sort of melting and molding into something new, that's the death part of the cycle. And and so realizing, like you know, every seven years. Biologically, we are not the same human. Not if a single cell in our body is the same cell as it was seven years ago. So we have an opportunity in this lifetime to shapeshift and change and mold and become a byproduct of our internal conversations over a prolonged period of time. So if we are on the path of radical transformation of truly finding our authentic nature beyond societal expectations of what we're supposed to be then by nature we are going to change exponentially and this is the path that I have been devoted to is to be the path of the mystic and to pull back the veil and to ask why instead of it being like well this is just the way that things are man I want to know why because I feel like just taking a number and falling in line and just following what has been done for me just feels like we're not going to change so for for me first and foremost I have become devoted to the death, purification, rebirth, integration cycle. And I look back at my old passport photo and literally it looks like I've had like 
like cosmetic surgery. Like my nose is significantly smaller now than it was back then. And I'm like, wow, it's real. We are like these interesting like flesh puppets that are evolving and morphing to our external conversations and and uh, and the, the, the media we consume and the people we're in relationships to and the and the, the things that we study and the plant you're just, medicines you're we slowly sit starting with. to look more like Andre <laughs> over time. Actually, actually though, like I look at us at the beginning of the relationship and I look at us two years later and we've like they're sitting like you know um jokes and like um, personal jokes that we have between us that we now just like like there's a same like a very similar pulse that we've got on and it's taken years of like learning each other's edges but we start to like mold and I think that that's also a part of what divine union is is to recognize that it's two holes coming together and then like molding and morphing together but we become the people that we surround ourselves with the most we become the top five people that we spend the most time with um we start taking on their mannerisms and and the way that we speak and the language that we use and so i would say that the stu- the, the the radical transformation was a byproduct of a devotion to wanting to keep finding my authentic nature and authentic nature is quite a challenging place to be in a world of like, is this mine or is this somebody else's belief system? Because we're so much like sponges. And I think that that authentic nature is found in the feeling, not necessarily the story attached to it. So the feeling that goes, oh my gosh, this feels amazing to paint a painting and blow my own mind on the other side of it. That's, that's my authentic feeling. So just keep finding that. And it just so happens to be that the jack of all trades of like, there's many different avenues that I find the authentic feeling in. Playing music and just getting into a rift and I'm just on my own and I'm like freestyling. I'm like, oh, this sounds really good. Wow, I could do this. I didn't know I could do this yesterday. Mind blown. All right, now I'm painting and it feels so amazing to see something, a byproduct that I didn't think that I could do yesterday. Mind blown. Going to the gym and building a booty. Oh, this feels good. Mind blown. Like it's, for me, it's just like a constant perpetual desire to want to live to blow my own mind and as a byproduct just so happens to maybe blow other people's minds but that's really not the intention and that's where it comes back to the authenticity so yeah the devotion to continue to die a million deaths of anything that's not in my authentic nature so that I can truly be of service from a place of real before we pivot off of this this topic and into what you do I think one of the most interesting things that people have to go through that are really dedicated to radical transformation. They're constantly evolving and changing is having to revisit past and people from your old life and having the experience (laughs) of just utter confusion from people that have, that know you one way and they're very similar. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, it's a classic example of no matter how woke you are, you go spend a few days with your parents, you're still a 16 year old asshole that's <laughs> actually your parents. And like, that is, that's real. And, and going back home to your, you know, revisit friends and people from your past where you just, you you don't really recognize how much you've changed and grown because maybe, you know, you're surrounded with people that are also on that same path. Right. But I think a lot of people are scared to change because of not wanting to explain it to the people around them are not wanting to disappoint the people around them because, you know, change causes a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you is how do you interact with that? Mm -hmm. And how do you, or if you do, you know, explain what you're doing to Mm -hmm. people (laughs) from your past? Because it feels very normal for people in our community Mm -hmm. what you do for work. But Mm -hmm. if you go try to explain it to someone from Missouri, they like genuinely won't get it, which is the experience that sometimes I'll have. (laughs) Uh, this is a really great topic and it's super right for me. And I'm definitely not going to answer this question from a place that I've got it all figured out. I'm learning and I'm listening and I'm growing with it because yes, with such radical transformation, for example, shaving my head and changing my name and, and starting to publicly talk about some like really deep vulnerable pieces of my journey. It, it, we, people judge what they don't understand, right? So if someone else hasn't gone through a full rebirth of shaving their head and desiring to change their name and moving to Los Angeles, then it's like, oh, she went off the deep end because it's just judgment of what our mind can't comprehend because we haven't experienced it. So of course, that's just a natural response is that there's going to be judgment that comes up around such radical transformation. Um, my desire is to understand through listening to other people's perspectives as opposed to assuming that they just get it or get get what it is that I'm I'm going on the journey with. And 
Um, I'm actually, I just booked my flights to go back to the UK and I haven't been back for five years and I am a completely different person than I was five years ago when I was in the UK last and I'm going to go spend some time with my family and, and I have a different name. You know, I was Charlotte when I was back in the UK. Now I'm blue. You know, it's, there's definitely an adjustment and my, a lot of my friends live in the same place and, um, are hanging out with all the same friend groups. And so I feel like um, the biggest piece to, bri- to create a bridge is to accept everyone where they're at and also recognize that the only piece that I can bring into the conversation is my responsibility of my emotions and my projections and judgment. So as much as I don't want someone else to, to, to judge me for my experience and my transformation, my invitation also is to accept their perspective on life and that they may not understand the journey that I've been on and they may not understand my relationship with plant medicine. They may not understand uh, my relationship with my beloved. But can I actually have compassion for their choices in life and their perspective and how they see their reality and and go in, and this is something that I heard, I don't know who they said the original quote, but it's to, to listen to understand, not listen to respond. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're listening to, to get our peace in, but can I actually listen to you and like try and activate my empathy to see life through your lens for a moment to allow compassion to be breathed into the space as opposed to trying to prove that what I'm doing is working. Right. And I think it's just a testament to happiness is relative and one is not better than the other, right? Mm. I think it's just, you know, if, Someone said this to me once and I, it really stuck with me. It's like, if everyone would just let everyone do what they need to do to be happy and most evolved, whether it is like, it can be two extreme ends of the spectrum. Those people in theory could be friends if, if there wasn't judgment between right. how the other person lived their life. Right. Um, and you're seeing that so much in today's world, but mm-hmm. I think it's, it just naturally is uncomfortable when people that we love so much mm-hmm. go through transformation. If you're not also radically, you know, changing. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a good uh, point to kind of like put some, just, can you explain some of your most, you've had so many of these radical trends, you you know, you mentioned shaving your head, a few other things, like what caused you to go down this path Mm -hmm. of death and rebirth? And can you kind of paint a little clearer picture of your story, Mm -hmm. which will then lead up into what you actually are up to currently? Perfect. Maybe we'll like get to I, it at the end of the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> like a crescendo mystery. all the way to the top. And then this is what I do on the other side of my hero's journey. Um, <laughs> We're going to find out you're an accountant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I work at the local office. Which street. I like don't judge at all because I, I got my CPA and I'm an accountant. So <laughs> no judgment. No judgment. Well, but just based off of everything that's spoken up until this point, it would be a little bit of a like a pattern. It would be a like, pivot. Yeah. It would be a pivot for sure. And... God love all of the accountants out there. Thank right, you so need, much. <laughs> I need them. My dad's an accountant. Love you, dad. Um, okay, so I would have to say, and I'm not just saying this because I'm uh, on the Into the Multiverse podcast that is predominantly focused around mushrooms, as we see. Uh, but I would say that my biggest, like, holy shit, life is never going to be the same again experience where I actually got to peek behind the veil and to truly receive the expansion of what is possible in the human experience was sitting with mushrooms for the first time. Um, up until that point, you know. What I, year was this? Uh, what, how long ago was this? Off the top of my head, roughly around, I want to say like seven or eight years ago. And um, wow. I just, you know, I, I, I went through uh, education and, and the, the whole, you know, like the, the, the programming of like, I don't want, yeah, my, my brain to be the egg in the frying pan. Like I, I, I don't want to take, say no to drugs. I was in, um, I was a college athlete playing tennis and we would have to pee into a cup and send it off to NCAA and they would write, write you not on drugs. Like, this is good. Like it was very, very straight edge. And so my upbringing was, was that I never really, you know, played or experimented with anything. And alcohol was definitely like, everyone was, yeah, it's okay to have alcohol. Like everyone's drinking on the weekends and no one ever frowned upon that. But anything outside of that was definitely big no-go. And this was the the conditioning of which, or the the narrative that I was allowing myself to play. Um, It wasn't until I actually graduated college and um, moved out to Los Angeles. 
and I had a neighbor who I've always had a really soft spot for the underdog, the, 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 the ones that are not like seen in class as like cool. I always just like love up on the, the quieter, nerdier types of humans. And, and she was my neighbor and she was like, you know, quiet and she always had something going on. And I just like would hang out with her. And she was like my only friend when I first moved to LA. And she told me about these mushrooms and she had this profound experience. And I had to work through a lot of fear programming around mushrooms because for me my brain could only go drugs that's in a category of say no to drugs period um but she would you know continue to talk about it in different conversations and it just got to the point where I started doing a little bit more research into it and I was very scared because it's like swimming in the ocean you don't know what's below you like it, it, the mind can create stories because it doesn't understand can't see the five senses can't pick up on what I'm going to get into so it's a scary endeavor to go into the unknown and simultaneously, there was a tug that felt like it was deeper than me that was going, I'm not going to stop whispering in your ear until there's some sort of action that is um, followed through with this little nudge. And so I decided to uh, do a mushroom journey with her and, and somebody that was not on mushrooms and, and he was guiding the experience. And we had these little mushrooms and put them in a little sandwich and um, took us out like on a, on a full day adventure. And... I remember going to the beach and being in the mountains and I saw for the first time in my life the, the difference between logically what a tree is. There is a tree and then it's got branches and it's got a, a trunk and it has leaves and that's from the mind. But when I looked at a tree on mushrooms, I saw this living, breathing being that was connected to everything. And I am part of all of this oneness that is connected to all of it. And I am the tree, you know, it was like, like this realization of like, there was a disconnect between me and them, me and nature, me. And it was a, it was like more of an egoic conversation of that is me. And then there's them and there's a separate and I need to protect myself. But what I started to realize actually through the guidance of, my beautiful mushroom friends was like, hey, how I treat that is how I get treated in return. And I am definitely connected to everything and everyone around me. And that is the world that I create. Now, to receive a big piece like this, when for the majority of my life, I played somebody else's role of what they think success is. That was when I truly felt like I actually started to live my life, my life. Not my parents' life, not my education life, not who I thought I was supposed to be, what I thought success was, but my life from feeling my excitement and my full fuck yes and my turn on and, and, and from that place start to go, hey, once I've tasted this flavor, once I've seen that this exists, I can't unsee it. So there's just a natural curiosity that follows. And I think it's important to point out that this experience on mushrooms isn't unique most people that experience mushrooms for the first time, their takeaway in some form of words, it might not be that exact phrase, is I realize that we are all one mm -hmm. and we are all connected. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of times mm -hmm. over that people have reported that after experiencing mushrooms. So there comes a point where you have to notice the patterns in it and accept some truth um, with it, which I, I think the more people that you can have have experiences on mushrooms that speak to different people. Like we, you know, you and I've talked about this. People will resonate with your avatar. They'll resonate with mm -hmm. um, an avatar of someone that's in a completely different ethnicity and age group and gender than you. And I think that you having this experience at that, that young age, you know, that, that that's young, seven years ago, you're still young mm -hmm. is, is so important because it's going to now speak to people that resonate with you and your avatar um, to maybe look at exploring what, what psychedelics could do for their own life. So I just wanted to point that out, but mm -hmm. continue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the mycelium network. It's connected to everything. So of course the nature of their inheritance and what they gift to those that decide to work with them is the remembrance of the connection of everything. And uh, you know, the mycelium network also represents like the brain cells and how our thoughts are connected to this external reality that is, 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 is becoming a, a magnetic charge to what it is that we're sending energy towards. It's like, it, it's almost like the answer is hidden in plain sight, but there has been a narrative that has been dominating 
our experience as humans for such a long time, which is feeding fear and division. But there is a truth that is so much deeper than that. And I believe that the most beautiful parts of my life have come from giving. Like it's, it's just giving and receiving is exactly the same energy and this interconnected nature that connects all of us. That if I give you my time and my presence and my genuine listening and my attention, or you come to my home and I make you a cup of tea and offer you some food, like it, 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 this awareness and this understanding that was gifted to me is interlaced into the most mundane moments, but it creates a fabric of a profound reality. I think that my spin on that of what mushrooms have done for my life is making me realize that I'm in the matrix versus being in the matrix, right? So like the mundane, all of a sudden you can be a character in your life mm -hmm. versus being in the matrix and having no idea that you're in this movie. Mm -hmm. And th so that, that is just kind of the parallel that I draw from what you said. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, we will eventually get to what you do, but we'll, we'll get there later. Crescendo at the end. I, crescendo at the end. <laughs> what have psychedelics taught you about relationships and your most mm -hmm. profound relationships, whether it be with Andre mm -hmm. or just people around you? Like how has that changed how you interact with mm -hmm. people? Ooh. A great question. I've never been asked that one before. Well, how, how have psychedelics taught me about my relationship? Well, first and foremost, there's there's multiple different psychedelics here at play um, in my consciousness that has been woven. Um, I would say that you know mushrooms um, have been have been a huge piece, and then also uh, working with ayahuasca and being in a deep training with the medicine in that space. So I have received profound insights and guidance because of the interconnected nature It becomes the new default of the fabric of the way that I operate. Then it's also recognizing that the relationship itself is going to be a very solid mirror that's not going to disappear. So when you're like, wake, when I'm waking up in the morning, there he is. When I'm in the bathroom, there he is. Like, so anything that surfaces within the relationship is there to be healed. So a deeper level of union can be created. Now. That also then means that anything that's coming up for me that is not founded in love and unity and, and, and a deeper level of intimacy is mine to take ownership of, to then be able to have the power to change it. Because the second I, yeah, because you did this and now I feel that way, like because you said this or because you connected with this person or because this, blah, blah, and now, and it's pulled up that within me that's only going to feed more division because there's a level of ownership on the path of transformation that needs to happen if we want to actually change. Because the second I give something outside of me the power over my emotions is the second I give all my power away to shift and evolve outside of that pattern. So there's like a very deeply committed path that Andre and I are both on, which is taking radical ownership of our emotions no matter what arises because it's not if, it's when. And when it arises... In, it's easy to say it right now, sitting up, sitting on your sofa and some tea and like talking about this, but when the trigger is there and my six-year-old self of the wound of abandonment believe that it's happening again on a physical level, to then be able to be the pattern interrupt into this program and to just say, I'm in this, this is what's coming up for me, this is my trigger, I'm really, my commitment is not to shame you or wrong you for the way that you've shown up. I just want to be in the transparency of what's not serving me right now. And together, let's work through this so that I don't have to keep creating pain and suffering for myself. Now, all of a sudden, he's going to want to sit even closer to me because there's nothing for him that needs to, well, I'm being projected all on, on the daggers are coming out. And there's then also that there's like a withdrawing. So I've just learned, and it's just something that's so powerful to be in union with somebody that also sees eye to eye on this piece, is that when these pieces come up, can we go, okay, I'm going to go and sit and integrate this piece. I'm going to go sit and, and, and allow this to be alive and know that it's safe for me to feel this within my dynamics and my union to be able to breathe it, let the wound actually have air and then eventually heal on its own as opposed to it being something that's just like, I don't let you see this part of myself, but it's like moist and it's getting like infected and it's over here and it's like, blah, you know, and the bandage is still on it, but it's like kind of like festering underneath the surface. It's like, hey, let's just air this out. I know this is a safe space for me to be able to feel this piece and then transcend it. So some of my greatest growth has happened in my union with Andre because of that one piece, which is 
the willingness to take radical ownership of our emotions and to meet each other with a place of compassion when they show up. Mm -hmm. So the mushrooms, I mean, ultimately, it's difficult to say where my individual lessons came from the medicine, but there's an overall deeper understanding of the interconnectedness of life. So the second my finger goes out, Oh, because I'm late because of this person or this happened. I love this visual that you do. You spin it right back. (laughs) Oh, oh, but hey, hold on. Actually, here's my power. My power is here. If I can just allow myself to receive that I created this, I also have the power to change it. I think there's such a puppet show waiting to happen with like blue in her hand, like (laughs) blaming the world for other other (laughs) shit that's going on. And it just... (laughs) spinning right back at you your hands is hidden in plain sight it's you all along this is i think this is an important point to make as well like one of the reasons why you've become one of my favorite people to talk to and just watch you know whether it be on social media is because you have this really beautiful blend of deep spiritual wisdom that is like on on a whole nother level and then you're also just the silliest goofiest person and i think that balance is so important because a lot of my favorite people, they're like deeply wise and just hilarious at the same time. And I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that it also speaks to the importance of joy in the spiritual journey. And like, can you just talk a little bit about that? Cause I think that humor is so needed in the world. Like there's so many, there's so much that we need to share with like deep messaging of, of how to make the world a better place. But like, radical optimism and humor and joy is like what draws people in and gives them hope which I think you do a really good job of why is that important to you thank you it's so important to me have you heard the story about otters do you know anything about no but I'm so excited to hear it this story changed my life Reggie Riverbear told me that otters they have their little family heirloom rock right and they play with it on the chest and they're flowing down the river and they're playing with their little family heirloom rock and then they have God made them a little flash fur pocket just for their rocks just for their rocks this is real this is 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 real their only purpose for these these pockets is for their rocks so they can play because God realizes nature spirit the great thing that created all of this realized the power and the importance of play and according to the jinkies one of the biggest diseases on the planet is over seriousness And we let this like this play version of ourselves just stay within our childhood. But then as adults, we we get this like permanently pinched expression on our face and everything becomes so serious. And ultimately, when you zoom out, we're floating on a massive rock hurling through space at millions and miles an hour held into orbit by a huge ball of fire. Like, (laughs) do any of us really know what the fuck is going on? I don't know. With otters with little pockets that they put their rocks in. There is an otter out there with a fur pocket. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> playing with his little family heirloom rocks like do, 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 do. and so anytime that things get like a little bit serious you can just bring in the otter medicine and remember the power of deepening our breath and infusing the in-between moments with like play and fun and that's just something again with like what I so love with my relationship with Andre is that we, from the moment we wake up we're giggling and we're laughing about like the dumbest stuff like we're making our bed in the morning okay and like pretty much most days we can either we make our bed every day but like pretty much most days we apply this right so we can either oh make the bed you know or we can act (laughs) this is gonna sound crazy but i love it um the imagination of that we are a couple on a tv show and we are competing with another swedish couple (laughs) That the whole point is to make the bed and the two things we're graded on is our time and how meticulous the bed is. (laughs) This is most mornings you guys do this. There is an invisible buzzer that we press. (laughs) And we go, okay, ready? Are you ready? Go! And we press the buzzer and we (laughs) click, 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 and we feed and make the bed. The bed's made meticulously. It is made fast and we laugh the whole time while doing it while visualizing this other Swedish couple that is like type A and they're like really good at making beds, but we were faster today. I'm like, I'm taking mental notes. <laughs> so also, Summer, write this down. I want to make a list of content that Blue needs to make. <laughs> One is 
the video of you with your hand pointing back to yourself and just talking to yourself and dealing with all the problems of the world. Two is we definitely need some content of you and Andre making your bed together every morning. It's so good. I just think that I was talking to someone about this last week about how they judge the success of their life. Like what makes a good day a good day? Like when you go to bed, you're like a crush today. Mm-hmm. And everyone was giving their answers. And I realized what my answer was, was how much of the day that I'm laughing and why I think that's important. It's like, it's a reflection of, am I loving what I'm doing? Am I loving who I'm with? Am I like bringing the joy to the situation? It's just, it's such a good gauge for me mm-hmm. of how much, of how, how how successful I am. Like the days that I'm having the most fun are also the days I'm doing the, the best mm-hmm. at all the things. Mm-hmm. And a point that you made it reminded me of there's a sentence in Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, which is easily the most transformational piece of literature that has come into the world over the last few years on psychedelics. And he has this sentence in there about how I might, I might botch a little bit of the sentence, but about how um, over introspection is the root of all depression or most depression. Mm. And I think the more that you can get mm. out of this introspective place that causes a lot of anxiety and depression and all these things. That's what psychedelics do. And so that's why they're so profound. But I mean, at the same time, some of the most profound experiences that people I know have had on psychedelics, you know, some are in, you know, the sound ceremony setting or clinical therapy setting where you're in headphones, eye mask, you're in your own brain working on your trauma. That's one extreme. And then one is you're sitting with your friends on a couch looking at a moss fall maybe just dying laughing and that's like the most epic therapy for a lot of people yes uh-huh it, it literally this it, i don't know 73 trillion cells in our body that are, their only job is to listen and respond to our internal conversation and a lot of suffering is born from living in the future or in the past in our mind which is not allowing us to receive the moment but when we're laughing we're nowhere else we're just here. And when we're laughing, we're also sending, you know, these 73 trillion citizens that are just literally like, yes, God, whatever you say, you know, I will be and become whatever you admit from this neurotransmitting brain. Um, it, it, when we're laughing, we're raising the frequency of ourselves. So we're no longer living in a body that's catering disease. That's catering, you know, this tension and this resistance because it's the complete opposite frequency. So it's the more we're laughing, the more we're healing our body. It's like it's so important. Um, and I really, really love what you said that, that that your gauge of how your day was successful. Most would say it's because of I hustled really hard, or I got three clients today, or I inbox did this. zero. Like, now, how much I laughed today is a gauge of my success because it's also a gauge of your health. It's your vitality, it's your radiance, and it's your magnetism. Yeah, it affects, it affects so many things. Mm-hmm. Two, okay, so two points I want to circle back on. One, you mentioned the gene keys, mm-hmm. which I'm so excited to learn more about because this is something that a lot of people I know have heard of, but they don't have any idea what it is. And with your story, which we haven't even really fully delved into, <laughs> you know, I, I, it would be amazing if you can just touch on you're your hearing and talk about that experience, finding that out, how the gene keys played a role in that, and then kind of how it led you to where you are now. Mm. And then crescendo will find out what mm-hmm. you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. So about, I'd say like about six years ago, um, I was diagnosed with hereditary hearing disorder. Both my brother and I actually, um, at the same time was when we both got tested at the same time. And what I received from the doctors was that it's progressive and it's incurable. Um, so they gave me a list of like different hearing aid options and they were just like, pretty much like, best of luck to you. And, and so, this was in like one meeting, right? Like you went in for an appointment. I did not know knowing what was going on and then coming out and getting that. Diagnosis. So I went in for the first one and they were like, this is deeply concerning. Like your results are like, it's like you're like an 85 year old, like an average 85 year old. You were 25, have, right? And at the, yeah, at that time I was around 25. Um, and um, that's like deeply concerning just in itself. I mean, like, wait, what? And then they break it, broke it down to that I'm deaf on my high tones and I'm above average on my low tones. So if I'm sitting on the, the side of the road and a motorcycle goes by, it's like bone shaking to me. It's like I can feel it through the entirety of my body. 
But then if I'm sitting in a restaurant with a woman speaking, the the background noise is a low tone and the woman's voice is a high tone. I'm just going to see. I have no idea what's going on. So if you ever see me in community experiences where I'm at a party, I usually pretty quiet because I can't hear anyone. And I, I've had to go through a really deep initiation for not succumbing to the fear of not being connected to the people in the space and still showing up. That's usually why you'll see me painting people because painting people is my connection to people still while I can't hear what's going on. I can still connect and offer something. Um, so when I, when I was diagnosed with this, of course, everything in my reality just kind of got flipped on its head. And, and after the, the first test, I went through extensive more testing and then eventually, like over a prolonged period of time, they saw that it was getting worse. So that's when they could tell that it was decreasing. And then they could also recognize it because my brother had it. It's hereditary. It must be something genetic. Um, and there's because it's based off of the, the small hairs on the inside of my ear canal, there's, there's, there's these hairs that are receptors that pick up the sound frequency that then the hairs go duh, 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 and tell the brain I'm hearing a sound. But my hairs in my ears were dying at like a, a pretty rapid rate. And you can never regrow those hairs back once they're, they're dead. There's no known cure for it. So that's when they gave it. It's incurable. So this was the, the essentially, you know, what, what they offered me. And they're like, all right, now go marinate on this. And first, initially, like, I just felt like, it felt like one of my limbs was just chopped off. Like, I... I I went through the whole range of emotions from like deep, deep sadness to then like denial of like that it's even happening. And my denial phase was just to spend all my time alone in my apartment. And I just, that's when I started painting. That's when I started creating because when I was painting, when I was making a beautiful piece of artwork, A, I'm not having to face off with the fact that I can't hear what people are saying. And B, I'm creating a world of beauty when I couldn't see any beauty in my situation. So when I was painting something, it would reflect back to me that there's still something beautiful about me because I would go into these narratives that, who on earth is going to want to date someone that can't hear them? Like, who's going to want to be friends with somebody that, that they can't communicate with? Wait, I might never be able to sing. I might not even be able to hear my... Wait, music? That's a huge part of my life. I haven't been able to hear words in movies for the past five years. All words and songs. I, I Like, if I'm ever, <laughs> like, singing a song, I'm making up my own lyrics because I don't know what the song is about. Um, and with movies, I can watch movies in complete silence and just, you know, read it with a subtitle because it's pretty much like similar to my experience. Um, but what actually, and this was around the same time that psychedelics got introduced to me, but what it, the psychedelics do or what specifically mushrooms in this case, they gave me a different perspective on what was. I was realizing that everything in our life, everything in our life is subjective to whatever story we place on it. And my story was, I am a victim of this. There's nothing I can do. I'm going deaf. I'm in my 20s. Um, I'm alone in this because people can try to empathize with the experience, but no one really understands what's going on. Unless you are in, in your 20s going from having full hearing to not having hearing, then you can't fully relate. And uh, my brother could relate, but he was going through his own process throughout the whole thing too. So I, um, the, the, the mushrooms gave me a different perspective on what was happening and how, you know, and it, 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 I feel like, you know, whenever these deep challenges, these deep curriculum happen in our lives and ultimately it happens to everybody, right? This is just my thing. Everybody is dealt cards in their life. That is a great challenge. But when I came across the gene keys, which is just technology, basically, and long story short, it helps you unlock the potential hidden in your DNA by recognizing that every challenge in your life has a superpower every single one and through astrology and an ancient text called the I Ching you can pull up your hologenetic what's called a hologenetic profile which is based off of your birth information to break down your greatest challenges and your superpowers and I found out in my hologenetic profile I have deafness now you can imagine while I'm going through this initiation I have no context for why this is a gift or why this is something that's supporting me and to see deafness and to see actually on the other side of the shadow of deafness is epiphany and insight. Well, it's informed everything that you're you're doing now. It's become I, my life's work. And I so <laughs> I told you this before we started recording. Last night I was <laughs> in bed listening to your TED Talk, mm -hmm. and Blue has an incredible TED Talk, um, which you gave earlier this year or last year. It was late uh, earlier this year. Actually. Earlier this year, yeah. yeah. And it's incredible. I mean, it goes through your whole story in a you know much more linear fashion than we have done, and it 
highlights the fact that, you know, you, you found out about your hearing and you really turned it into your superpower and you talk about why. And so when I was, when I was watching this lesson, I was thinking about, I was like, whoa, I wonder how different your life would have been Mm -hmm. if you would have taken the path that most people take, right? That you find out you have an ailment of whatever it is. Um, and, and when our health is compromised in any way, that's like everything else fades. Mm-hmm. That's like the, the highlight when our health or anyone around us health is compromised, everything else becomes so trivial. But how different would your life have looked? Like, do you ever think about that? If, if you, you know, would have kind of hidden from the world rather than being like the amazing, like loud, you know, really inspiring personality that you are now, both on and offline. Mm-hmm. But you could have totally taken the other path. Mm-hmm. And that's the choice, right? That's the responsibility. Because it comes back full circle to what I was talking about before. If we can take radical responsibility, and I use the word radical because in this situation, if I take a responsibility that I created this, I have the power to become the creator, not the victim of my circumstance. But the pill to swallow that says, hey, Blue, you created this for a specific reason. That took me on a whole journey into the levels of my unconscious mind of why I created a defense mechanism that said that there's a belief system that it is not safe to hear this world. So I got to go into the crevices of my own consciousness to rewrite the narrative that I had created over a prolonged period of time subconsciously saying that I don't want to hear this. And that was a deep journey. And I had a lot of assistance from psychedelics and plant medicines and people like within my family, like judge the experience because they, they, it just seems as drugs. But what I was doing was I was carving myself out of a well of potential depression that I could have easily walked down to take ownership and responsibility of why I created this in the first place to recognize that actually my greatest gift to the planet is born on the inside of this deepest shadow that has presented itself to me. And the gene keys and psychedelics gave me a roadmap for me to come home into the gift of what has always been here, which is the ability to feel beyond words, beyond the five senses. Words lie all the time, all the time. People present themselves versions of themselves that we, that we think will be accepted by others. But energy never lies. You can sit in the room with somebody in complete silence and I will pick up exactly where they're at in their journey exactly what's in their field this is the shamanic realm this is the i send an email and it flies i don't see a letter fly out the computer but it's being sent there is a realm that we do not pick up by our five senses that we're not sending energy energy towards because we're so direct distracted by our five senses but there's the realm of feeling it's in our bodies it's in our heart it's in our gut do you feel like when you walk into a room you can really because i mean and, and people report this all the time with blindness or when any of the five senses are compromised that the others are heightened did you really notice a stark difference from when your hearing started to go you started to have enhanced you know feeling in in your other senses or was it something you're like I want to lean more into understanding this was it a conscious choice or did it just happen to your body well Albert Einstein talks about energy can't be created nor destroyed only changed in form so I don't like to use the word hearing loss because it, it insinuates that I've lost some sort of energy. That's actually not the case. My energy just was redirected to a different to a different area. Now, I was in the disposition of resisting, fighting, being so upset that I couldn't connect with people that I wasn't allowing myself to receive that there was a heightened sense of feeling. Once I started to surrender, which took a couple of years to my circumstance, and I still am finding edges of another layer of opportunity to surrender to this. So it's an ongoing journey. Um, But once I stopped fighting it, then I could start receiving the gift of what it was. So on the other side of the surrender was then the ability to tap into why it was happening, which I was starting to notice, you know, like the shift of people's eyes or the direction of their feet, body language, there's like our bodies communicating, like I can feel someone's heartbeat and how fast it's beating, meaning that they're nervous or that, 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 that you know, that there's, there's certain cues in the space. I can walk into it. Like when I walked into your apartment, instantly I feel a really good energy. I feel the emotions that you've been in prior to this podcast because it's in the space. I can feel the emotional state of the people that work with you and the cohesiveness between how you communicate when the cameras are not rolling. Like there is a lot of subtle cues that I'm picking up on on a 
constant basis. And that's a lot of information that's coming at me. A lot of information. And simultaneously recognizing that I'm help, here to help people heal through things that they don't even realize that is leaking their life force energy because I have this deep sensitivity. And so it is a piece of artwork, but every piece of artwork needs the right frame. Like, so I needed to spend years of my life carving out the right frame to put myself in positions where I truly thrive as opposed to seeing myself in a nightclub with a group of people and thinking that that's going to be my environment. I can put myself in a nightclub with a bunch of people and then tell myself the story that I'm unworthy and less than because I can't vibe with these people. Or I could recognize that this is not my frame. Mm. It's so beautifully said. I think that something you said at, you and Andre both actually, um, at a dinner that we hosted a few months ago mm -hmm. around psychedelics and what it means to the future of wellness. And mm -hmm. we had all these incredible thought leaders there. And you guys were speaking about media as medicine. And I've been thinking about that since you said it, because it's made me interact differently with Instagram or wherever I'm consuming content, because now I'm aware of, of who is, you know, in your words, using media as medicine versus media um, in the other way. And I, would just love to hear a little bit more about that because I think it's really powerful and it, it'll it help. One of, the, one of the biggest issues that people face right now is, I mean, obviously depression and anxiety is the biggest problem that the world is facing. And a lot of that comes from com comparison and social media and this thing that can be used for good or evil. Mm -hmm. And you've been really dedicated to using it for good. I think if you can share a little bit more about how, do you, how you use it for good mm -hmm. where it's additive to your life, it can be really impact impactful for people. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, we used to wake up in the morning and um, we would watch the news, you know, or like our parents or our grandparents, right? That was how we would find out about what's going on in the world. Now, specifically within this bubble and within this community, how do we get our news? Well, we, we watch Instagram stories. Right, So we get our daily dose of what our friends are up to and what's going on in the world. And oh, she got dyed her hair or she, they, they got pregnant. They have a baby. Like we know all or of Blue this. Blue and Andre are making their bed in yeah, a yeah. really weird fashion this morning. <laughs> Competing against a Swedish couple because of Instagram story. Blue's talking to her hand on the internet again. Yeah. <laughs> right? So like, we find out what's going on in our ecosystem because we are the news. We are media. We have become the media. So we can either use media to create more comparison, separation, and and like a hierarchy, like I've got something figured out that you don't. Um, or we can utilize this as a platform for media as medicine, but it is already here. So we're not going to avoid the fact that this is how it is right now. We're the first generation to experience this. This is completely brand new. We have a choice point. It's here, inevitably, whether we ignore it or not, it's here. How we use it can be medicine or it can be depletion. It can, it can, it can sap energy or it can bring energy it can bring life it can, it can bring inspiration so for me it was like okay I had a long time of fighting Instagram and fighting stories and, and 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 resisting it and then I actually allowed myself to melt deeper into it and it's an ongoing journey with my relationship with it but to say okay if I'm creating a interest it's interesting that it's called Instagram story like what story are you putting out there what story are you putting out into the world and I made a commitment that I'm going to utilize my platform to if, if there's a whole world of people being brainwashed into division and fear, then we can use media, which is also a brainwashing tool to brainwash people into believing in themselves. What would that look like? like to, to, to tune into my content and walk away from it going, hey, I'm a little bit more inspired or like you know, there's a 40 days of sweat challenge going on or there's a 40 days of devotion challenge going on. Like, hey, I can do that. I don't need to be in this specific financial bracket to be able to buy this course or thing. It's free. I can literally just do 40 days of devotion. I, I, if I have my breath, then I can do the challenge. So the invitation for me is to just recognize, okay, I have this platform and I have 35,000 followers. Put 35,000 people in one room, that's a lot of impact. It may be small and considerable amount to um, to people with with influence but really recognizing that I have a level of responsibility and every single day my intention is to create authenticity on my platform I don't need to always be happy that's not necessarily what the point is but even when I'm in it to let people know hey it's okay you're not alone 
Like I know it's really tough right now. I know mental health is a really in, like, important topic that we get to look at. You're not alone right now. I'm really struggling today. But remember that the, the sun comes out tomorrow. Like that, it's just an opportunity, even in the depth of my goo and my ugh, to just bring some love. It reminds me of, so one of my best friends has this saying of what his mission is for his life, and it's to leave everyone that he interacts with 5% happier. Mm-hmm. And I think you're kind of saying the same thing, but with social media, like to have everyone come interact with your content and then leave better, right? Because mm-hmm. I definitely interact with some social media all the time. I'm like, I, I feel worse. I feel significantly worse <laughs> after after looking at that. And then I feel bad about myself because I wasted time watching the thing that made me feel worse. And then it's like this cycle, but I think that's a really positive message for people. What is, with all the stuff you're doing, and we've kind of touched on like little nuggets of it here or there, what are you, what is the vision for your life? I think you've accumulated, like it sounds like you've You've just accumulated all of this input, whether it's from plants, mushrooms, mm-hmm. um, people, just your own journey, your own artwork. But like, what is the vision for your life? Like if you're, let's say you're a hundred, you're, you're probably 150. You and Andre do a lot of biohacking stuff. You're probably going to live really Andre long time. predominantly, I'm just like, he's like, take me along with you on this journey of hacking the human potential, please. <laughs> just from being in his energy field, you'll probably yeah, you know, yeah, live yeah. that long anyways. So let's say- Let's say you're a hundred years old. Like what is the vision of what you're wanting to create? Mm. That's a really beautiful question. My name blue um, represents beauty, love, and unity. And my, my birth name is Charlotte, but blue is my mission is, is to remind us of the beauty that there is in this world, because it's so easy to become so disconnected from the beauty when all we are flooded with is how the world is is messed up and how we are suffering and um and how this injustice is happening and this is what's happening to the planet and um i think awareness around it is is key because then it allows and fuels us to be able to create change and also recognizing can we appreciate what we have right now truly and and become reconnected with the beauty on this planet so First and foremost, we can only see the beauty on the planet if we can see the beauty within ourselves. And so my commitment and my devotion isn't just necessarily in the what do I do, but it's in between moments that may every single person that ever comes into my life feel seen in my presence. May every single person that comes into my life feel heard and feel, and feel loved. Whether it's somebody that's serving me in a restaurant or I'm at the post office or it's my group of friends, but my intention is that I leave my legacy in the mundane in-between moments. And that creates a fabric of something much bigger, um, a a legacy that I can't even fathom or comprehend. But that's a trail of love that over a prolonged period of time plants very potent seeds that before I know it in 10 years' time, I live in a garden of roses. And so um, it's to restore beauty, love, and unity by supporting people to see the beauty within themselves and to activate parts of their archetypes, so their artist, the muse, the creatrix, that they didn't even know existed within them, so that they can live to blow their own mind. And a byproduct of that, when you start loving yourself, you can start having a much more capacity to love others. You have a much bigger capacity to love the planet and all of the creatures on this planet. And then we're going to start one by one, start seeing a change, because the the position, the power that are in place are a byproduct of the collective consciousness. So we must start. And this is like age old, classic spiritual one-on-one with ourselves. And how can we have space holders and safe people to be able to explore that within ourselves? And I'm devoted to that. You had a quote in your TED talk, which I love. It's a Maya Angelou quote. Mm. And so you kind of answered this question in the format of that quote of, you know, people won't remember what it was. People won't remember what you looked looked like or what you said, what you said, but they'll remember how you made them, how you made them feel. People will remember what you said or what you did, but people will remember how you made them feel. And I think that a lot of, a lot of people, because I've asked this question to different people over the course of my, of my, of my years. And people usually answer in what they're, what they're building and what they're achieving, which is the all actually great in and of itself but if you are missing this piece of how you're making people feel and the mundane like what i'm taking away from this conversation which is really important is 
all of those things that are like your resume Mm -hmm. are just actually not reflective of who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that have achieved great things, but no one really likes them that much because they're kind of an asshole. (laughs) And I just think it's, this is, I think people will really appreciate that just to remember like while you're building still want all the things Mm -hmm. um, because many of the things that people are building all around us are so going to make so much impact Mm -hmm. on the world, but it's in the mundane um, that you really, Mm -hmm. that you really, really make an effect on people. And then, and then with that being said, also I have my, my visions and my goals and on the, on the bigger scale of what it is that I'm offering and what it is that I'm, I'm creating and birthing into the world. I just feel like, there is my will and thy will. And I'm in the constant process of m- melting my will and into thy will. And I feel incredibly guided where I'm supposed to be. And for the most part, it's in directions that I can't even comprehend right now. So yes, I have my my creations. Um, and with that being said, it's like the classic Carrie Underwood. Jesus, take the wheel. And Jesus just comes in and is like, I got you, Blue. <laughs> um, but like what I'm actually, you know, uh, creating now is that I have with um, my business partner and dear sister and mentor and muse and everything in between. Reggie the River crescendo there. is happening. Huh? The crescendo is happening. The crescendo. Here We're we finally go. finding <laughs> out what Blue does. Um, I have created a, we have created a program called Fluorescence, which is a 10 week online, um, immersive experience for, um, women or those that identify as women, womb bearers. Um, and it's essentially a deep journey into all the tools that I wish had been delivered to me, but took me a long time of research and development and trial and error and data collection to get to this point of the biggest tools in my life that have created exponential transformation. So for example, we have the founder of the Gene Keys, Richard, who um, comes in and, and sprinkles his wisdom and activates the, the, the awareness around Gene Keys. And then we have um, a deep, uh, uh, we have a, a, a witch from Iceland that comes in and talks about the microbiome of our gut and how to recalibrate by listening to our intuition when eating and intuitive eating, we have, um, we go into the, the portal of the universe and, and how women have the Stargate enterprise between their legs. And it's, we are the birthers from the beings from one dimension to the next. So all humans on this planet came from a woman and recognizing the power of what it means to be a pussy bearer. Like, like we have a, a module around that piece. We have a module around building an altar and learning how to work with the directions and the elements and how to work every single day refreshing your altar and calling in the elements to be able to be extremely powerful beings that learn to use your intuition as the first foremost compass to navigate our reality. This is a curriculum of the ancient mystical arts in modern day time of what it means to be a woman bearer or a womb bearer in 2021 and, and moving forward. So that's the first curriculum. It's called Fluorescence. It's a 10 week program online. And then the second round is in person. So we do a week immersion. Um, We haven't done one yet. We're just running the first rounds. Um, But I feel like the direction that this is moving in is allowing us to remember that, you know, there's a quote from Sadhguru that talks about how he's not teaching people to be superhuman. He's teaching people that to be human is super. And to remind us as we constantly in our consciousness want to go more, more, up, up, out. I want to go to space. I want to go out is recognizing, hey, can we master what we have? Can we allow ourselves to work with our natural cycles and our natural rhythms and our intuition and the potential of the human capacity and to have a safe space to experience that? So outside of that, then there's the fluorescence. And then I also have a podcast, which is interviewing brilliant minds from all different walks of life that are masters and the leading edge of their craft so that um, it's a place where people can just plug in and utilize media as medicine. As a kid, I always just wanted to be able to travel the world and just interview brilliant minds and be, a, you know, a host. And I came full circle and here I am, you know, on season two of Deja Blue podcast. And so doing that and um, we're also looking into potentially investing in a physical location like a Hogwarts. Um, and, uh, and I see Andre rolling in as Dr. Strange kind of vibes. And we've got like the whole thing and you come and you spend a week at like, you know, in Venice, is this happening? No, in this would this would be somewhere like the vision is like somewhere in the middle of the forest where the fog rolls over in the winter, and it's like, and there's a windy path that goes up, and then it's all covered in ivy, and and there's classrooms, and it's taught by like like masters, 
and and it's a it's a place where you go to up level your operating system your ios system um to tap into a default a life of a default of magic i love that i mean you're working on so much so so many things um each one of them is like more interesting than the last when you speak and and people have reflected this to me you know with with content we've filmed together in the past or just being in your presence you're just like a walking sound bite mm -hmm. everything you say um really you know one of my favorite things to think about is like most of the things I try to say are either going to be funny or relevant and m majority of the things that come out of your mouth if not 100% are funny or just highly relevant Aww. and I think that's um that's the goal Aww. so I have a few more questions for you um I feel like I could talk to you forever but specifically okay so on on your podcast um if people want to listen to one of your episodes that you think does a really good job of giving them an ins insight to who you are what you're up to like just where to start because I, I find often like when people recommend their podcasts like I go and there's like a hundred episodes do you have like a few people can start with mm. to start interacting with your content well my initial response is start with episode one <laughs> and go on a journey with me because it is a journey and I've had people that have uh, many people that have reached out and said I've been listening since episode one and my life has significantly changed because of the the curriculum that you have guided us through and ultimately episode one is is my story and then you get to feel for me and then I talk about my diet in the jungle with with working with shamans um for, for you know for an extended period of time and dieting with a master plan teacher called bob and Santa and what that the insights that i got from it and then going into and so we go on a journey and then go into my hearing loss and then i go into preparing for a ted talk and 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 we go on a journey as a as a, as a family and and I've given the little community called the bluebirds and we we're like fly free but we're all together it's just like a little flock of birds and and then each different episode just takes us to a different crevice of human consciousness. And I believe that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are and how you identify yourself, there's medicine interwoven in it for everybody. And so, you know, it, it's, that's a journey. It's like 64 episodes or something up to this point of, of, of podcast. Um, but I think also when you go through the titles of the podcast, they're, they're pretty like, clear that hey you want to talk about like what's happening in mexico with the satanic rituals and alien abduction or do you want to like you know go over here and talk about the power of the universe like, <laughs> i noticed that when i was when i was when i was doing you know just just stalking you on the internet in preparation for this the titles of your podcast are really engaging it's like witches satanic rituals it's, it's like <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is that i try to live my life by. i try to remind myself of it every morning of, I don't know where I'm going from here, but I promise it won't be boring. Yeah. And, that, and that's kind of what I felt when I was I looking that. at your podcast titles. I was like, <laughs> literally, I have no idea what this is going to be about based on, the, you know, you kind of, you, you obviously you get the, the theme, but I promise it's not going to be yeah. boring. <laughs> so, and that's how I feel when I, when I talk to you and everything that you're up to, like, it's a lot and it's just, none of it's boring. <laughs> not, not at all. Perfect. Um, last two questions for you is to bring it full circle, given this is a, a podcast about psychedelics and mushrooms, mm -hmm. is if you had to pick one lesson, the most important lesson that psychedelics and or mushrooms have taught you about how you see the world or how you live your daily life, what would it be? How to sum up all of my teachings over the last seven plus years into one of the most impactful lessons I've learned while I'm looking at a piece of art that someone's like tripping hardcore and it's perfect. Um, I would say, and this is backed up with also one of my greatest teachers, Reverend Brianna Lynn. Um, but like the most sacred thing is what is. Whatever is alive, whatever is present, whatever it is that comes up that wants to be looked at, is an opportunity. <laughs> Everything is an opportunity for growth, is an opportunity for up leveling. And to really create that as a softened depth of breath that I trust this to, you can't fail. 
You can't lose. You can only grow and refine. And that is applicable to the, from the smallest things to the largest things, but everything is an opportunity to grow. I love that. Beautiful. Okay. Last question for you is where can people find you? Where would you point them to? Obviously your Instagram, which your handles changed a few times as you've yeah. gone through all these radical transformations, um, <laughs> which I found when I was, when I was looking up, I was like deep down the Instagram. I was like, wow, her name, her Instagram handle was here. It is kind of reflective of where you were at in your life. Yeah. I like that your name changes with you. Yeah. So where does your <laughs> current, what is your current name? The current name uh, um, is Blue of Earth. B-L-U, no E, representing beauty, love, and unity. Blue of Earth on Instagram. Um, because the name has changed multiple times. My website is, because it used to be Blue Cosmic Eagle, it's www.bluecosmiceagle at gmail.com. Oh, no, sorry. At Blue, <laughs> so we'll, we'll link it up. Like we'll link it up. Yeah. <laughs> www.bluecosmiceagle.com um, is the website. And um, Instagram is probably the best place because I'm like tapping into the stories and it's a really interactive space for me with other people. Um, and then we have Fluorescence is the program that we're running right now. And that is www.fluorescence.earth. Um, and all of the information is in my bio as well. And you can access the TEDx talk that I did. That's also a link in my bio on Instagram. Um, and a lot of my artwork is on my website. And you can also email me. And so there's many different formats and ways to connect in. I love that. And I think also why people resonate you with, with you so much is because you're so accessible. Mm -hmm. So as a closing comment, Thank you mm. for all the depth that you bring to so many people and also just all the laughter and all the joy. Mm. So I'm excited to continue to talk to you and continue to get to know you more. And I'm so glad we did this. Yeah, it's so good. I knew it was going to be a good podcast from the, before we even started filming that we were like laughing like to because of this, uh, this moss <laughs> wall. It was like, oh, this moss wall took us thing. away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I can't wait for people to hear this. I think it's going to be really, really impactful. I feel very honored that you've asked me to come and sit on this beautiful sofa in this beautiful space and this new set that you have going on. And also, I just want to acknowledge you for bringing this conversation to this topic and how this, um, this realm that you are diving into with the mushrooms and the multiverse is, is extremely ripe right now on the planet. So thank you for hearing the call and not only hearing the call, but taking action on it. And to all of the lives and the, all of the lives you've already impacted and to all of the lives that you will impact. Thank you. Truly, truly, truly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for tuning in, you guys. Thanks for diving into the multiverse with us. We can't wait to continue to bring on amazing thought leaders like Blue and others to learn more about mushrooms and how they can save the world. Thanks for diving into the multiverse with us. If you're interested in being a future guest on the show, sponsorship, partnership, or you're just mushroom curious, we're always looking to expand our mycelium network. Find us on Instagram at multiverse or online at yourmultiverse.com. See you next week.